Do you think neural networks can be made to reason? Yes, there is no question about that. <laughs> Again, we have a good example, right? The question is, is how? So the question is how much prior structure do you have to put in the neural net so that something like human reasoning will emerge from it, you know, from learning? Uh, another question is all of our kind of model of what reasoning is that are based on logic are discrete and, and, and are therefore incompatible with gradient-based learning. Mm -hmm. And I'm a very strong believer in this idea of gradient-based learning. I don't believe that uh, other types of learning that don't use kind of gradient information, if you want. So you don't like discrete mathematics? You don't like anything discrete? Well, that's, it's not that I don't like it, it's just that it's, it's incompatible with learning and I'm, I'm a big fan of learning, right? So in fact, that's perhaps one reason why uh, deep learning has been kind of looked at with suspicion by a lot of computer scientists because the math is very different. The math that uh, you use for deep learning, you know, it kind of has more to do with you know, cybernetics, uh, the kind of math you do in electrical engineering than the, the kind of math you do in computer science. And, and you know, nothing in, in machine learning is exact, right? Computer science is all about sort of, you know, obviously compulsive attention to details of like, you know, every index has to be right and right. you can prove that an algorithm is correct, right? Uh, machine learning is the, the science of sloppiness, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. So. Okay, maybe let's feel around in the dark of what is a neural network that reasons or a system that is works with continuous functions that's able to do uh, build knowledge, however we think about reasoning, build on previous knowledge, build on extra knowledge, create new knowledge, generalize outside of any training set ever built. What does that look like? If, uh, yeah, maybe, do you have inklings of thoughts of what that might look like? Well, yeah, I mean, yes and no. If I had precise ideas about this, I think, you know, <laughs> we'd be building it right now. But, and there are people working on this or whose main research interest is actually exactly that, right? So what you need to have is a working memory. So you need to have some device, if you want, uh, some subsystem that can store uh, a relatively large number of factual episodic information for, you know, a reasonable amount of time. So, you you know, in the in the brain, for example, there are kind of three main types of memory. One is the the sort of memory of the the, the state of your cortex, and that sort of disappears within twenty seconds. You can't remember things for more than about twenty seconds or a minute if 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 you don't have any other form of memory. Uh, the second type of memory, which is longer term but still short term, is the hippocampus. So you can, you know, you came into this building, you remember where the where the the exit is, where the uh, elevators are. Um, you have some map of that building that's stored in your hippocampus. You might remember something about what I said, you know, a few minutes ago. I forgot it all already. Of but course, it's, it's been erased. But yeah. you know, but that that some would be in your it. in your hippocampus. Uh, and then the the longer term memory is in the synapse. The synapses, right? Um, so what you need if you want a system that's capable of reasoning is that you want the hippocampus-like thing, right? And that's what people have tried to do with memory networks and you know neural training machines and stuff like that, right? And and now with transformers, which have sort of a, a memory in their kind of self-attention system, you can you can think of it this way. So so that's one element you need. Another thing you need is some sort of network that can access this memory, get an information back, and then kind of crunch on it, and then do this iteratively multiple times. Because a chain of reasoning is, is a process by which you, 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 kind of, you update your knowledge about the state of the world, about you know, what's gonna happen, et cetera. And that, that has to be this sort of recurrent operation, basically. And you think that kind of, if, if we think about a transformer, so that seems to be too small to contain the knowledge that's that's uh, to represent the knowledge that's contained in Wikipedia, for example. Well, a transformer doesn't have this idea of uh, recurrence. It's got a fixed number of layers, right. and that's the number of steps that you know limits basically its so, representation. But recurrence would build on the knowledge somehow. I mean, yeah. it, it would evolve the knowledge 
and ex expand the amount of information, perhaps, or useful information within that knowledge. Yeah. But is is this something that just can emerge with size? Because it seems like everything we have now is too not small. Just, no, it's not clear. It's not. It's not clear. I mean, how how you access and write into an associated memory in an efficient way. I mean, sort of the original memory network maybe had something like the right architecture, but. Uh, if you try to scale up a memory network so that the memory contains all of Wikipedia, it doesn't quite work. Right. So, so th there's there's a need for new ideas there. Okay, but it's not the only form of reasoning. So there's another form of reasoning which is through, which is very classical also in some types of AI, uh, and it's based on uh, let's call it energy minimization. Okay, so you have uh, some sort of objective, some energy function that represents the 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 um, the quality or the negative quality okay energy goes up when things get bad and they get low when things g get good so let's say you you want to figure out you know what gestures do i need to to do to grab an object or walk out the door if you have a good model of uh, your own body a good model of the environment using this kind of energy minimization you can make a you can make you can do planning and it's uh, in optimal control. It's called it's called model, pred model predictive control. You have a model of what's going to happen in the world as a consequence of your actions, and that allows you to, by energy minimization, figure out a sequence of action that optimizes a particular objective function, mm -hmm. which measures you know minimizes the number of times you're going to hit something and the energy you're going to spend doing the gesture and etc. So, so that's a form of reasoning. Planning is a form of reasoning, and perhaps. What led to the ability of humans to reason is the fact that, or you know, species you know that appear before us had to do some sort of planning to be able to hunt and survive and survive the winter in particular. And so, you know, it's the same capacity that that you need to have. So, in your intuition, is um, if we look at expert systems and, and encoding knowledge as logic systems and as graphs in this kind of way is not a useful way to think about knowledge? Graphs are a little brittle or, or logic uh, representation. So basically, you know, variables that, that have values and then constraint between them that are represented by rules. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little too rigid and too brittle, right? Yes. So one of the, you know, some of the early efforts in that respect um, were, were to put probabilities on them. So a rule, you know, you know, if you have this and that symptom, you know, you have this uh, disease with that probability and you should prescribe that antibiotic with that probability, right? That's the mycin system from the from the 70s. Um, and that that's what that branch of AI led to, uh, you know, Bayesian networks and graphical models and yeah. causal inference and variational, you know, yeah. method. So so there there is, I mean, certainly... Uh, uh, a lot of interesting work going on in this area. The main issue with this is is knowledge acquisition. How do you uh, reduce a bunch of data to a graph of this type? Yeah, it relies on the expert to on the human being to encode uh, to add knowledge, and that's essentially impractical. Yeah, it's <laughs> so not that, scalable. That's, uh, right? that's, that's a big question. The second question is: Do you want to represent knowledge as symbols, and do you want to manipulate them with logic? And again, that's incompatible with learning. So uh, one suggestion which you know, Jeff Hinton has been advocating for many decades is replace symbols by uh, vectors. Think of it as pattern of activities in a bunch of neurons or units or whatever you want to call them. And replace logic by continuous functions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and that becomes now compatible. There's a very good set of ideas by uh, written in a paper about 10 years ago by uh, Leon Botou on uh, who is here at, at Facebook. Um, um, the title of the paper is From Machine Learning to Machine Reasoning. And his idea is that uh, a, learning, a learning system should be able to manipulate objects that are in the same space, in a space and then put the result back in the same space. So it's this mm -hmm. idea of working memory, basically. And it's, uh, it's very enlightening. And in a sense, that might learn something like the simple expert systems. I mean, it's <laughs> you can learn basic logic operations there. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. yeah, there's a big debate on sort of how much prior structure you have to put in for this kind of stuff to emerge. That's the debate I have with Gary Marcus and people like that.